Good morning. Good morning, Sweets family. It's lovely to see everyone this morning. Um, those of you grabbing your coffees, come join us. We're going to get started. Um, everyone stand up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness, your faithfulness, Lord, for your sun shining this morning. I just thank you for um, spring coming and what spring represents, new life, Lord. And I just thank you for the life that you you sacrificed for us on the cross so we can have a life with you, God. I just thank you for your goodness, Lord. I thank you for what you're going to do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
I could sing of your love forever. 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 I could sing of your love. And the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let Nila set me free. I'm happy to be in his truth, and I will daily lift my hand. I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. Forever, I can sing of your love. Forever, I can sing of your love. Forever, and though I feel like dancing, it's foolishness I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance. says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. Let's worship Him this morning. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. All together. Here I am to say that you're my God. 
choosing me. Thank you for choosing each one of us sitting here, Lord, to be your children. If we just let you, if we just say yes to you, God. I just thank you so much for always being good in it all, in all the things. You are good and you are sovereign and nothing we have is ours anyways. But our heart is yours, God.
Jesus, you are the king. We thank you that we can send our hallelujah, our praise the Lord to you. I thank you that you are a king that is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. And I ask that as we worship you and continue to worship you today by looking to your word and by trusting your spirit to open our ears and help us to understand and to live out your truth, I thank you that our lives would be lives of worship defined by your truth and defined by a king who loves his church, a king who came and became a man and gave his life so that we could have life in him. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be, uh, you can be seated. And uh, don't sit down, Cass. Don't sit down. 
What? We got double? Oh my goodness. I, don't, I might as well not even preach today. We got double babies, double newborns. So we're going to do a double baby tour today. Is that okay? Um, and so um, we're going to send them in different directions. And so you can start on the, uh, the west corridor. We're acting as if it's a huge church here. <laughs> and you guys can head down center aisle and, uh, and go ahead. This is baby, baby Quincy and baby May. Mar- Marcy May. Marcy May. Marcy May. Oh, my goodness. Oh. You got to break them in sometime. Oh, she's adorable, guys. If your hearts aren't full now, oh my goodness, we have to worship the king. We got to witness uh, two beautiful new babies. So congratulations, families. And now the kids can head out for kids' church. Now your hearts are like triple full. You got to send your kids out (laughs) into the care, the loving care of our kids' church and uh, teachers and nursery workers. Today, we're going to be looking at Paul's fourth example of Christian living. And this title is All In for the Sake of the Gospel. It is Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 to 30. We're closing out chapter 2 today. And this is a part of the, the, the scripture that is once again giving us an example of what it means to live this life that Paul has been talking about in his letter, a selfless Christian life. And so we've gotten to look at Jesus. And I said last week that Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example, but we also have human examples, fallen humans who are following after Christ. And Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so we have these amazing examples of Paul. He gives himself as an example. He says, Timothy's an example. Now, Epaphroditus is who we're looking at today. And he has quite the name. This name reminds me of my eye condition. Some of you know I have an eye condition. Uh, Others just think that I just never get any sleep and my eyes are perpetually red. But uh, the truth is, I went to the doctor about this and he says it is an uncurable eye condition. So I went to a naturopath and the the naturopath said to me that um, it, it can be cured if I give up dairy and sugar and wheat and chocolate. So it turns out I have an incurable eye condition. And it's called, it's called blepharitis. I went with the first, uh, the first opinion. Um, well, blepharitis epaphroditus. So we have this name. It's, it's quite the name. And it's a, a name that is maybe a little hard to pronounce. But if you break it down, it's epi in the Greek, upon. And Aphrodite, uh, Aphrodite, or Aphrodite um, the, the Greek goddess. And so what it really means is to be blessed and honored by the Greek goddess. And so we have this Greek man who is a born-again believer in Jesus Christ with the name to be honored by the Greek uh, goddess Aphrodite. And I I don't know why they didn't just give him a good Latin Latin name or an anglicized version of the name or or do something for them, for for, uh, Epaphroditus, but they just just went with it. And uh, I know we even do that for some of our Dutch family relatives when they come over from Holland, right? Um, We meet them at the airport and we're like, okay, Shitska, you are now Susan. And that's just what we do. We just give up, rename them at the airport. Uh, and uh, Epaphroditus, he never got that privilege. He is Epaphroditus. You know, I, I kind of laugh. The, um, there's a group uh, of women that uh, often uh, go up to a camp out by Orangeville. You, many of you ladies have been there to Dorcas Camp. And I, I laugh because it's like, okay, you guys had a choice when you named that camp. Because you do know that Dorcas had another name. You could have called it Tabitha. That's beautiful. 
you know, Tabitha camp. But no, let's just go with Dorcas camp. And so uh, we've always had a little bit of fun with that uh, when the ladies come home from their Dorcas camp. But I get the, I get the spirit of it. It's memorable, right? Um, when you're calling it Dorcas. But Epaphroditus was the one who carried the gift. He's the one that brought to Paul what he had need of in his time of need. And he was bringing this gift from the, Phil- the Philippine church. Now, the great thing about Epaphroditus is he was just a guy. You know, we need these types of examples in the, in the Bible of just a guy who's serving God. He didn't write any letters, didn't write any big books. He, he, didn't, he wasn't a big leader within the church. He was just a guy that gets this mention two times in the New Testament here in this section. Then later on, he mentions him in this letter. And yet, if you were to count words in the letter of Paul's letter to the Philippians and count how much is said about different people, Epaphroditus is second only to Jesus. You know, Epaphroditus gets like 154 words for him. Uh, Timothy comes in after that at about 108 words for him. But 150 words are dedicated to talking about this guy named Epaphroditus. You know, I've often... uh, told you that church is messy and this is why paul's writing this letter he wrote to the philippians because he had to deal with some some mess in the church but also because he loved them and he wanted to encourage them but you see throughout the letter he's got this purpose guys you gotta fight for this unity you gotta build unity in the church and this is how it happens it happens by having the mind of jesus it happens by not thinking of yourself but to think of other people it happens when you think of other people as better than yourself these are the things we need to do this is the way this is kingdom thinking and this is what you need to do and here's the examples here's jesus here's paul here's timothy here's epaphroditus you need to change the way that you see yourself and the way you see others you need to look out for the interests of other people and not just your own interests and so he's saying to them i want you to fulfill my joy this is a joyous letter on my relationship with you is full of joy but he says listen there's my joy cup's not quite full you can fill it by having this mind and these are the examples that you need to follow and so he's dealing with some of the mess in the church there's some people fighting there's some disagreements within the church there's some false teachers that have been kind of peddling their influence around the church and he's dealing with these things And I've often spoken about uh, the mess in the church in the context of Proverbs 14.4. It's one of my favorite Proverbs. It says that where there are no oxen, the trough is clean. And the cow is out of the barn. It's just clean, right? Gutter's clean. Trough's clean. But much increase comes by the strength of an ox. You know, ox isn't the neatest animal to keep around. But I tell you, a lot gets done when you got the ox. And so it's necessary My dad illustrated it beautifully when he whitewashed his barn, chased the cows outside, whitewashed it with lime, that fresh smell, and put fresh straw down, cleaned the whole barn out, looked so nice and bright white, like blinding white. As he stood in the barn, he says, Wes, he says, I'm thinking I'm just going to keep the cows outside from now on. He was just joking around because he knew of any people that know it's the dairy farmers that know that, you know, there is much increase. There's much productivity that comes from the Holstein. And so we let them into the barn, even though it's a messy business. And I tell you, church is a messy business. If you come to Sweets Corners Church, you're like, oh, you know, I want to, you know, go to this church. It seems like they got it all together. I tell you, we will soon teach you a lesson. We'll, we'll show you. It's, it's messy. Life is messy. Every time we reach out and, and bring new people in, and, and sometimes our, our oldest saints, sometimes we can be the, the biggest mess, you know, just make a, making a mess out of situations and making mistakes. And, and this is where we need these examples. This is where we need to learn. You know, in fact, we're building a new building across the road. We might be tempted to say, oh, you know, I can almost smell that new carpet smell, Right? And all those all beautiful, you know, the beautiful carpets and and we got, you know, all this drywall is perfect paint. Everything's going to look fantastic on our first Sunday. I almost, I'm almost tempted to, you know, when on that, that first time a cup of coffee gets spilt on that carpet to just give an applause. You know, just like Kaylee, uh, music practice night, we got to get the mat in again with a vacuum uh, shampooer. But, uh, you know, that first cup of coffee, it's going to happen. Why? Because we encourage people to have fellowship. We eat together. We serve together. We live together. The drywall is going to get dinged up. 
There's going to be some touch-ups needed. But this is the thing. It's, it's symbolic of the mess that comes with just living and serving and loving people. And oftentimes, we need to look at how we're going to react to this mess. And so Paul gives us the example of Epaphroditus. You see in the Bible, there's two contrasting responses that you can have towards the messes in life. And it's neat because both of them are symbolically represented by a a wash basin. We have, for example, Pilate standing before the people and the people yelling, crucify him about Jesus. And they're angry and they want to murder the son of God. And Pilate looks at this mess, and what does he say? Bring me a wash basin. And he washes his hands and says, I wash my hands of this. I wash my hands of this. I'm I'm innocent of this. I wash my hands. And now on the other hand, you have the disciples gathered together, and their feet are dirty, and the king of all kings is there. The ruler, the creator of the universe is there. And what does he say? He looks at the wash basin And he says, I'm going to use my hands to wash those dirty feet. You know, Pilate says, I'm going to wash my hands so that they aren't dirty in this. And Jesus says, I'm going to dirty my hands to wash those dirty feet. And this is what Epaphroditus is. He is one who is all in for the kingdom of God. He's, he's, he's willing to get dirty. He's willing to risk his life. He's willing to, risk, to, to give of his time, his energy, his love. You can see his heart is being given here. And so let's look at this passage. Verse 25 of Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. You see, Timothy staying with Paul. And so Paul's going to continue on with Timothy. Paul himself can't go. Obviously, he's in prison still. And so he says, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need since he was longing for you all. And he was distressed because he had heard that you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him. But not only on him, but God had mercy on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So Paul says, therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Therefore, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his own life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. I love how Paul introduces Epaphroditus in verse 25. My brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. And he, in, in this section of pa- this passage, in verse 30, he also uses a word when he says Epaphrodi- Epaphroditus did not regard his own life. And there's a Greek word in there which actually gives the, uh, the imagery of casting lots or, or, or gambling. It's, it's to throw alongside In fact, what they often said about some of these Christians in the early church is they called them the God gamblers or those that gamble their life on God. Because the Christians did things that were irrational just like a gambler would. They throw it all in. They throw it all away in their eyes. And so they looked at these Christians and they called them the the God gamblers, those who risk it all for God. They saw the Christians do crazy things. Plague would come through. Everybody would like, oh, you know, throw the corpse by the road. And, and they would have somebody sick in their home. Everybody would evacuate the house and they'd leave the sick person to fend for themselves. You know, this was their attitude. You know who came along? The Christians. The Christians came along and collected the bodies and took those bodies and buried the bodies. The Christians came and they went into homes and they ministered to people in their dying hours. And, you know, we'd like to believe that they were all divinely healed. The Christians were walking in God's protection. You know, they're claiming the blood of Jesus and not dying at all. Not a Christian died. That's what we'd like to say. The truth is, as many Christians did die. You see, Christians do get sick as well. And many Christians were protected. But in the end, what it showed people is these people threw their lives away. They were the God gamblers. These people, they gave too much. They did too much. They sacrificed too much. They were just risking their life. They they did dangerous things. They went and visited people who were in prison for preaching the gospel and came as representatives of church to visit these people. 
that, do they have any brains? Do they not know that they could be arrested as well? That they could be beheaded along with that prisoner? You know, what are they thinking? They were the God gamblers. They were messengers and ministers, ministering and serving to each other's needs. I love that word, ministers. We look at that word, when we think of ministers, we think of a pastor, you know, a minister. Or we think of somebody who takes a cabinet position and they are the minister of such and such, right? And with that comes a a level of respect and also with cabinet ministers comes, you know, uh, extra reward. You get more money in in taking on a portfolio, more responsibility, more money. But you have to understand that the Greek word minister, it actually had a totally different understanding. The word minister was given to somebody, let's say a successful business person who had a lot of expertise, came to a place in their life where they're like, you know what, I love this city. I love this country so much. I love my city so much that I want to see this new library built. So I am going to give my expertise. I'm going to give my finances. I'm going to finance this thing, and I'm going to make sure it gets passed through, and I'm going to make it happen. They were to take of their own resources and give. A lot different than today, eh? This is, this is what a minister was. And so this is what Epaphroditus was as an example for us. Now, how many of you would say, we need more men and women like Epaphroditus? In fact, we could use a church full of Epaphroditus's. <laughs> we could fill this church with people like this, and we would be so blessed. How do we do this? The answer is in verse 30. He says, Paul says, receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with all gladness. And here's the key. And hold such men in esteem. You see, honor is one of our greatest tools in your discipleship tool belt. If you want other people to become like Jesus Christ and to follow along after Jesus Christ, then honor is one of the greatest tools in your discipleship tool belt. You see, this is how it works. What we celebrate, we replicate. You understand that? As Paul instructs the Philippians to become, um, or to welcome and to honor Epaphroditus, he's not just saying just hold a, a warm reception for him, have a little party when he gets back. He's not just saying to welcome him, but they're saying, I, he's saying, I want you to hold him in high esteem. I want you to honor him. And what he's doing is Paul is showing that self-sacrifice and service and dedication to the gospel of Jesus Christ are values that we want to see in the family of God, in this community. These are the things we want to see more of. And so what happens is two things happen. One, Epaphroditus gets honored. He is esteemed. He feels valued and will continue on, encourage that his family is praying for him and treasures him, and he's loved by them. And he feels seen. It's an important thing. But another thing happens. The rest of the church, when they see Epaphroditus esteemed, are going to say, these are the things that we celebrate at this church. As Philippian believers... As Sweets Corners believers, we celebrate these things. And so, therefore, we are going to do these things because these are the things that honor God, further the kingdom, and make us the family that we are, and give us victory in Jesus Christ. And so let's be the church that celebrates the Epaphroditus among us. Those who serve quietly sacrifice greatly and love deeply. This is what God calls us to do. Now, to honor somebody, how do you honor a person? In order to honor a person, you need to esteem them. In order to, you need to look up to them. It's hard for me as a tall person to look up to people, right? Because in my, in my tallness, most of my looking is down, uh, except for if Cassie's brothers come to church, then uh, you're, if your uncles come, then I'm always just like, hey. Yeah, and so I'm looking up. And and the same thing goes for how we are to honor somebody is to think less of ourselves and to think of them as higher than us, to esteem them as better than ourselves, to look up to others. We need to lower ourselves. I mean, it all comes back to that passage that we talked about at the beginning of this letter of Paul to the Philippians. And so here's the areas 
that we need to put our focus. One is that as a brother, Epaphroditus teaches us to love God's family. As a brother. You see, this is a family. And you can see this affection of Paul. You see it in verse 26 where he says, and that he was longing for you all. And he was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So listen to the language. It's the same language that Paul has. You know, Paul says that my beloved and longed for brother, and he calls them Epaphroditus. He longed for the Philippians. He was away for them, from them, and he was distressed. Why was he distressed? Because he had heard that they heard that he was sick. And so it was hurting his heart. He wanted to go to them and say, hey, guys, I'm okay. You know, we're back together. Everything's good. You see, they want, he wanted them to see him in the flesh so that their hearts could be at peace. You see, as far as they're concerned, Epaphroditus is deathly ill. And they're not going to find out that he's well until he comes back to them. And so Paul's like, I got to send this guy home. But you see the heart of Epaphroditus for this family. You see, he was a brother in a family because you see that he was distressed on their behalf. That word distress is substantial. It's the only, the only other time that this word is used is used talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Epaphroditus wasn't sweating blood drops from his, from his body, but he was distressed. He was having some Garden of Gethsemane style distress. His heart was going out towards these people. And he wanted to be back with his family. Now, you have to understand, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Contrary to popular belief, there is no universal brotherhood of mankind. There is no universal brotherhood of mankind. There is the nuclear family. There is families in which there is brothers and sisters. But outside of that, The only other family is the family in which God is father, and the only reception into that family is through the Son, Jesus Christ, and therefore we have something so special as a church. You know, people oftentimes use that phrase loosely, you know, it's like, hey, bro, (laughs) hey, bro, hey, bro, and it's like, you know, no, you're not, you're not my bro. I I only have one bro, and that's Melanie, my sister. She was my bro. (laughs) But then I got adopted into the family of God, and it's like I'm surrounded by bros. I, I'm su- surrounded by family, the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. You know, in fact, Jesus told some religious unbelievers, they're religious unbelievers because they actually secretly wanted to kill Jesus, and he's like, he, they're like, oh, we're sons of Abraham. And Jesus, well, he says, actually, he says, your father's the devil. He's the murderer. He was the murderer in the beginning, and he's the father of lies, and he's a liar. And so, um, but I'm not saying that you have to, every time someone says, hey, bro, and they're not a Christian, you don't have to, your father's the devil. You know, (laughs) hey, do you want to come out to Sweet's Church? (laughs) It's not going to work well for you. That's not the point. The point is, is that you have something really special here. And that is that you have a father in heaven and that Jesus Christ is the one who has brought this family together. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we're family. We're family in the house of God. You are the house of God. This is just a building. You know, I I always get a kick out of the fact that we celebrated our anniversary. I tried to change it. It didn't work. But I tried to change our anniversary from being the day that we began meeting together as a church, which means we're about 150 years old. But uh, it kept on switching back. So I finally gave up when I was a young pastor. It's just, ah, okay, we'll celebrate the day we got our building. Um, And so we're only 100 and something years old. But... uh, but I think that, you know, I should have stuck with it because when we go across the road, are we going to turn one again? Are we zero? Because we're starting over. New building, we'll put a new plaque on. It's like, we're zero. <laughs> we're going to start over. No, you, when you guys got, when you got married, you celebrate your anniversary on what? On your anniversary day, the day you got married. Not when you got your first house. This is just a building. It's a beautiful old building. But you know what makes this building special is the people. This is what makes this building sweets. You know, sometimes you have that feeling of, oh, are we going to lose sweets going to a bit of a bigger building? It's not that much bigger, but it's a bigger building, definitely. Are we going to lose sweets? It's like, no, we're bringing sweets across the road. This is the church. And I tell you, as we're all able to gather in one place, worshiping together, the moment we leave that building, guess what? It's just a building. It's only a church when we're at the church because we are the church. And so we are a family and we are the house of God. And in this family, we forbear. 
We put up with things because it's family. Do you ever notice that? You'll have a friend who does something, and it's like, oh, you just write them off because that was, like, unacceptable. But a family member does, and it's a different story. You make exceptions for family members. It's family, right? And you even say that. Well, that's family. There's a different level. And I tell you, it's a different level in the family of God. You forbear or you bear others' um, weaknesses and different things because we realize that we're growing together in faith. And we also realize this. People are bearing with you. You are also a person that in some way, all of us are burdening someone else around us with something we do, something way we act, and we're oblivious to it. And eventually the Holy Spirit will correct that and work in that. And until that day comes, I'm so thankful that you guys put up with me here at this church. I am. You know, because there's things that that need to change in my life. I haven't seen it yet. You might be like, oh, we know them, you know. But you just continue to bear with the work of God that's happening in my life. Just like I'm bearing. It just sounds bad. We're just all bearing with each other. (laughs) But we, we overlook certain things. And we pray for each other. And we encourage each other. And we follow the example of Jesus Christ. And so Epaphroditus, as a brother, he teaches us to love God's family. And it's going to become more evident in the last days. Timothy, remember, tells us in 2 Timothy, sorry, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy Timothy 3, verse 1, he says that it's going to be terrible times in the last days because people will become lovers of selves. It says they'll turn against their own families. They will not respect their, their parents. They'll be disobedient to parents, and they'll be lovers of selves. And I think we're in that time now. I think we're in the last days. If there's ever a clear sign, that is a last day sign. And I tell you, the church, as you guys love it'll shine all the more brightly as people see a family that loves each other. Epaphroditus also, as a co-worker, he teaches us to labor in God's field. I love the word there. Co-labor is actually the word soon and energos, two Greek words from which we get the word synergy. <laughs> That's a word that got way overused by those self-help writers. They, they took and stole that word. It's, it is a Paul word. It is a word that means to co-labor together. It is when a group of people with the same mission and the same mindset do something. It's powerful. And as laborers in the field, it is an amazing thing to see what God can do as new lives come into this this community. As we see people who are far from God coming to relationship with God and beginning to follow after him. I love I love planting seeds. Anybody get seeds started yet for their gardens? Anybody early as I am? We got a couple here. We got the the diehard Linda Boom gardeners getting all they're going to survive off that garden this summer on top of having a newborn baby. Johanna, you still got to pull the weeds. Uh, (laughs) Oh, that's your job. Okay, good, good. So I love that process. Don't you love that when you see them shooting up and, and it's just like life? What a miracle. All the genetic code is inside this tiny, sometimes the seeds are so tiny that I have to like take a little tweezers and like, you know, try to drop one in. I drop 10 in instead. They're so tiny. And yet out of this comes this beautiful flower or this amazing vegetable. And this life is all in the seed. And this is, here's the thing. As we labor in the field, you get to do that. You get to plant the seed of God's word into the lives of people. You get to speak scripture. You get to speak truth. And as you speak the truth of God's gospel message into the lives of others, you get to see grow from that new life in Christ. And so you pray over it and you water it. What a privilege to labor in the field of God. And so this is why Paul says, he's my co-worker. He is my brother. And we are working together for the sake of the gospel. And he had such a great attitude about it, Epaphroditus. You know, he, he followed Jesus. He was like Jesus in this. You see, when Jesus gathered with his disciples and they were all looking around, Jesus wasn't looking around like this, but all the disciples are looking around, you know, saying, oh, you know, who's the foot washing guy? Oh, we forgot to get a foot washing guy. There's no servant. That's the thing we forgot. And they're looking around thinking, okay, you know, who do we get? You know, do we get Thaddeus? Nobody knows who he is. Do we even know? Do you even know there's a disciple named Thaddeus? You know, like, oh, maybe we'll get Thaddeus or we'll get James. Oh, no, not uh, James, son of Alphaeus, not James, um, James, brother of Jesus. No, James, we actually call him James the Less, <laughs> right? We'll get that one because there's no other mention of him in the Bible. Maybe one or two times he gets mentioned. You know, we'll get one of those guys to do it. And they're talking about it and they're trying to figure out who's going to be the servant, 
Somebody's got to do the dirty work. And meanwhile, Jesus is getting in the robes of a servant and getting prepared to wash those dirty feet and to go around and to serve his disciples in this way. And this is what Epaphroditus does. He doesn't get a whole lot of talk in the Bible. He isn't this big, big character. He's a guy like us who's a fellow brother. He is a fellow worker, and he humbly serves and gives God glory by his service. You know, it's like the, the iceberg imagery. You see the iceberg, and you're like, man, that's massive. You just can't get over how massive those things are as they float through the ocean. And yet all you see when you see an iceberg is 12%. You know, 88% of that is below the water. And you don't see that. And yet that is what the church so much times misses out on, is all of this service that happens. And what Paul's doing here is he's saying, hey guys, esteem this. Should, like, like, let's make a big deal of what's happening here. This is Jesus. This is what Jesus is doing in the hearts of lives of people. As we serve, we are giving glory to God. You know, we don't see the things that happen behind the scenes often. You know, we'll go home. Also, sometimes I'll be sitting over at the computer just doing a few last-minute things. Sometimes I'll get carried away. I'll be here for an extra hour or two. And then Kathy Shirt comes, opens the door. Hello. She comes in the church, and she starts cleaning up around the church. And she's just following in her mom's footstep. That's what Lorene did for years. And then later in the week, uh, Joanne comes in, and, and uh, Craig comes and does some, I think he does the vacuuming. They just come in, start serving, helping, cleaning, you know, keeping this place clean week in and week out. You get our nursery workers, we got our soup volunteers, cafe workers. But it doesn't stop there. Finally, there's one last thing. And Warren Wiersbe says this about Epaphroditus. He's balanced. He says, I love the fact that he's a balanced Christian. Balance is important in the Christian life. You see, Epaphroditus didn't stop as that being a brother, or he didn't stop at being a servant um, in the uh, um, and, and one that just had fellowship, but he also fought for the faith of the gospel. He fought for the, uh, he, he fought the fight. You see, you can, get, you can get unbalanced in the sense that you're all about fellowship. You're just like, let's get together, let's get together, and you're always getting together with other Christians, and you're great at fellowship, but yet you don't realize that we got to fight a fight here. we got to reach the loss here. The church is, is an army. We're, we're marching forward. Or you can get all about, you know, we got to fight for truth. we gotta, we got to do all of these things and totally neglect, neglect fellowship. And what Paul realizes and what Warren Wiersbe says is that Epaphroditus was a balanced Christian. He was a lot like, remember, Nehemiah. Nehemiah in the Old Testament, he went out to build the wall. But as he was building the wall, he was preparing for the attack of the enemy. And so it says he literally worked with the people, carrying a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other hand. He was prepared. He was prepared. So this is what we're called to do. Build the community of God. Serve together. Love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. But fight the fight that we are called to fight. And you see, as a soldier, as a fellow soldier, which is the third description Paul gives, Epaphroditus teaches us to risk it all for the sake of the gospel. Verse 30, he tells us, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death not regarding his own life, to supply what was lacking in your service to me. Risking his life for the sake of the gospel. And you might look at it and say, well, he wasn't really risking his life for the sake of the gospel. He was actually bringing supplies for Paul. But you have to understand that all the work that happens within the church is for the gospel. The nursery workers taking care of the babies are doing so so that we can hear the word so that we can be encouraged in our faith so that we can spread the gospel. The kids' church workers are teaching the gospel. The soup makers are preparing and creating community that, that allows us to show love and to serve each other and to disciple each other, encourage each other, build each other up in the faith, and build community so that the church can be the church and bring more people the message of Jesus Christ. And then the cleaners and the greeters and the Sunday school class teacher, all the different things that happen here are for the furtherance of the gospel. No matter what it is, change a light bulb, you furthered the gospel. Fix our church lights so they don't turn randomly on and off all during the service. You definitely helped in spreading the gospel. Just all of these things. And so he risked it. He risked it all. You see, when he volunteered, 
as the church is sitting around and saying, okay, we got to help Paul. You see, no other church helped Paul. Paul said it later in the letter. He's like, no other church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Which is shocking, because Paul wrote so much of this, and we look up to him, and we see all the things he did in his missionary journeys, and yet we hear now, looking, looking back at these letters, that nobody gave Paul any money. They didn't help him as he was doing his work, except for the Philippian church. And so Paul was cared for by them. And the Philippian church, their heart says, how can we help Paul? And they says, well, let's do it this way. Let's send him this love gift. Let's send him some money to care for his needs so that he can keep preaching the gospel from jail. Who's going to go? And everybody looks around. Oh, shoot. 1,300 kilometers. Who's going to take the next month to travel to see Paul and maybe get robbed or shipwrecked? Who's going to do this work? And Epaphroditus said, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. All in. Send me. I'm going to go. And 1,300 kilometers he traveled. Now, there's nothing like going to the other side of the world. Well, 1,300 kilometers isn't the other side of the world. But going a far distance and then just being sick when you arrive. I've done it twice, two Philippine mission trips. My last one, I was like four days lying on my, uh, lying in the motel room just sick. And then the, the last mission trip I was just on, I was, I think, three full days lying on my back with a displaced or with my disc out. And just, you just feel terrible. You feel like, you feel like I travel halfway across the world to be a burden, you know? And, and it's just not a nice thing. And yeah, I love that Paul, he doesn't highlight that big time. He just said, you know, he acknowledges it. And then he talks about all the wonderful things Epaphroditus was to him. And, you know, I'm sure it was maybe a little bit of an inconvenience having this sick guy show up. It's like, oh, thanks for the help. What uh, virus are you bringing? You know, and Paul had to probably care for him. And, and so, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't the, the most convenient thing. And yet, Paul teaches the church, esteem him, because guess what? We're all down at times. We all have times where we're just beat up. You, know, you could serve for years and years, and suddenly something hits you in life, and you're just like, now you need people to care for you. And then the church comes around that person. And so I love the church for that reason, that we are called to be the soldiers who are fighting, fighting for each other, fighting with the kingdom, risking it all, being risk takers for the kingdom of God. You see, you're in a battle. You're not just in just a family. You're not just a brother or sister. You're not just in a community that is working together for a harvest, but you're in a battle. Understand that Satan hates you. Satan hates your family. He hates this church. Satan wants to destroy you. He is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He has come to kill, steal, and to destroy. He is a formidable enemy, but God is greater. And so armor up. That's why Paul tells us, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet ready to prepare for the, with the gospel of peace. Have the shield of faith. Have that helmet of salvation. Take up the sword of the Spirit. Pray always. Have the belt of truth. Be prepared because we're in a battle here. A battle for truth. A battle for love. A battle for the person of Jesus Christ. We are defenders of the gospel. And so remember that in all that you do. So Epaphroditus doesn't bail out on Paul. He comes through. He helps him. And uh, takes great risks. What are the risks that you are taking? What risk are you taking for the kingdom of God? You know, our God is whatever we are willing to take the biggest risk for. So if you look at your life and you look and you see, well, the biggest risk I ever took was that time where I went and made that purchase. <laughs> that was the biggest risk I ever took in life. You know, what is your God? Because your risk exists on the level, or your God is, is the one for whom you have taken the biggest risks. And so ask yourself that question. Now, I began talking about betting. I'm going to close with that. And I'm going to say this. You know, I am betting it all on God's house. You know how they say the house always wins? Well, in this situation, God is the one. It's his house. And therefore, they can say we're throwing our lives away and we're just being risk takers in how we serve and in what we do for the kingdom. But here's the thing. It's God's house. And the house always wins. And I'm in his house. And so I'm betting it all on God. And I want to encourage you. I'm all in. I want to encourage you to be all in with me as we serve God together. Let's stand up together. Father, we thank you so much for your living word today. I thank you for blessing us with the, the presence of these precious gifts from you, these babies that 
are so beautiful and, uh, and show new life and are such an encouragement to us. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you are bringing new life to sweets so often. And I thank you that you are uh, also bringing new lives, lives that are dedicated to you. People that have been lost in darkness and are hearing for the first time the gospel. And I ask that you would continue to transform lives. Father, right now we, we lift before you the, the, the people who need to experience your power that are trusting in you. We pray for Lori Shirk's granddaughter, Maddie. We ask for a, a healing for her, that you work in your power. I thank you that we can trust you and look to you with the eyes of faith. We also pray for Stephanie as she's uh, um, Sharon uh, Foreman's niece as she's recovering from her surgery. We thank you, Lord, that uh, the surgery was successful and that she uh, um, the, that no nerves were damaged in the, in the process. Uh, I thank you for answering our prayer. We ask that you continue to help her, guide her on this journey, bring healing to her and strength. And uh, Father, we pray for Gentina, that's um, Angela, Yuri's mom. We pray that you would heal her, that you would help her, that you would guide her, that you would lead her in a path that would give her clarity as to the steps that she needs to take, that you would give her the freedom that she desires, and uh, that you would heal her, her neck, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you can do all things. And we look to you with the eyes of faith because, God, you are the living God and uh, you can be trusted. And so, Jesus, we ask that as we go out and live out this message, that we could bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. And thank you for those that have joined us online and have a fantastic week.